like my book. So on behalf of the Toronto Transit Alliance, I want to thank you all for coming tonight um, and taking part in the discussion. We're going to open up the, the discussion a little later. Um, I'm just going to uh, put a, a little plug in for the Toronto Transit Alliance and the 1% solution. Uh, the whole idea that we have is to have a 1% sales tax dedicated to funding transit. So that's my small plug. I won't talk about it anymore. Um, I just want to do a couple of reminders. Everybody, cell phones off, please. So they don't ring. Um, and what we're going to do is we'll uh, have a few. I'll question the panel for a little bit, and then we'll open up to questions from the floor. And Haru will take around the microphone. So if you have questions, we'll wait till the end for that. Okay. Um, oh, and also we have a live Twitter feed, and the Twitter uh, hashtag is UnlockGridlock. So if you'd like to get up there, um, if you want to ask a question, we'll try and take questions afterwards. Um, I also want to make an announcement that um, Clayton Ruby is here, but he has to leave at 7.30, so we're going to make it as quick as we can. Okay? Um, now let me introduce uh, our panelists. Uh, first, we have Clayton Ruby on the end. Uh, Clayton is one of Canada's leading lawyers, an outspoken proponent of freedom of the press, and a prominent member of the environmental community. In late 2005, Mr. Ruby became the acting treasurer or elected head of the Law Society of Upper Canada, and in 2006, he was made member of the Order of Canada. Next, we have Gary McNeil, president of Go Transit, a division of Metrolinx. Gary has over 35 years' experience in the transportation industry, managing projects such as TTC's Rapid Transit Expansion Program, the SkyTrain in Vancouver, Vancouver Rapid Bus Service, and Terminal 3 at Lester B. Pearson International Airport. Grace led Go Transit since 1999. And last but not least, we have Alfredo Romano. Alfredo has been, we've known each other for about five years, I guess. Um, he's the CEO of Castle Point Group, as well as a major stakeholder in the Eastern Toronto Waterfront and the redevelopment of the Sony Centre for the Performing Arts. He is a member of the Children's Circle of Care and founding director of Save the Kids Now, and also one of the founding members of the Toronto Transit Alliance. So I think what we'll do now is we'll ha I'll, I'll ask a few questions, and I'll ask you to, to keep it to about two minutes, your answers. If you need to go over, um, you can, but it will, we'll try and keep it on that. So let me just turn here to the next question. So the first question, I think we'll start with you, Clayton, um, will be, what are your thoughts on why it has taken so long to get dedicated transit funding? I think part of it is, is context. Um, we live in a political context where the important uh, lead idea for most politicians is how to cut taxes, how to stop spending, how to, to take back what we presume we did have and in the last election in Toronto characterized as gravy. And as long as the predominant question is not how do we serve the people with public good, but rather how do we save those taxpayers, homeowners, from paying more, they're going to come up with very bad answers in terms of public goods like transit. Um, and second is that we, we, for some reason, don't view uh, the expenses on roads uh, the lack of taxes on cars and on gasoline as part of the overall spending package. For some reason, that goes out of our mind when we talk about balancing and weighing public expenditure. Yeah, I, I, I agree. <laughs> no. um, I, in relative terms of city building, it really hasn't taken that long to talk about dedicated uh, funding for transit because actually for many years we had um, a fairly strong uh, funding source for public transit, either through tax dollars or from uh, the provincial uh, revenues coming in to fund transit. Um, I think as, as uh, Clayton said, it's really been just recently where government's priorities have shifted. Uh, uh, a lot of money has gone into health and education uh, for, for various reasons. Transportation has become, was for a number of decades actually less important. But now we're almost at a point in time where the city and the city region really is really at a tipping point where there's been so much growth without the necessary transportation infrastructure to support it that we really are reaching that point where we have to do some major investments. And so now the debate is do we give up those areas where we've actually been funding? So for example, you give up money for hospitals or schools or whatever it is uh, because there isn't enough money in the tax base to pay for transit or do we actually start talking about dedicated funding specifically and uh, historically, the, the conversation has always been focused on 
um, the individual transit project as opposed to the stronger benefits for the whole region of, of what transit actually does. Uh, well, certainly, just to echo uh, both Gary and uh, Clayton, we, uh, something happened in the 70s and the 80s, I'm not sure what it was, but we were uh, happily and merrily building about a mile of subway every year in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. It's a golden era, we grew up with that. And then something shifted, and I think it's definitely as a result of a shift in the government focus on, on the tax base. Um, and also uh, about need, because we had a significant amount of urban sprawl, which I was part of, obviously, as a developer. You, you were car-based. Um, you could build anywhere in the 905 region and uh, not be dependent on transit. Now that that circumstance is reversing dramatically, and we have a tremendous influx of development in the core of the city, the transit now is, the, the transit issues are now hitting us right in the face. And, quite rapidly. So um, something changed and uh, I think you can attribute it to other priorities but um, this idea of uh, you had to pay your way uh, for your uh, transit uh, benefit and not recognizing the greater good um, because whether it's education or health certainly uh, transit plays a significant role, you can never forget that, it plays a significant role in the health of our society, health of our economy, and certainly makes our education system that much stronger if you can move people around the city much more easily and safely. Right. Okay, so um, the Board of Trade has said that it's, it's now costing $6 billion, gridlock is now costing us $6 billion a year. And then you look at um, commuter times. Commuter times in New York are at 59.2 minutes, in Los Angeles they're at 51.9 minutes, and here in China it's 80.1 minutes. So we, we definitely have to get our, a handle on this. So we've got politics as one, one angle where you can't, you, can't, you can't start building and then stop building and start building and stop building. Um, and then we've got the, the financing is the issue as well. So we, when you have politics controlling the financing, um, should we be looking at getting financing here in Toronto for Toronto Transit? Or should we be looking at creating a financing model that is in play for regional transit? So Toronto and the rest of the region. Do you want to go first? Okay. Uh, that's, uh, I'm not sure which part of the question you'd like to answer first. But Pick one. Okay. Um, <laughs> In, in terms of a financing model, I mean, I think it would be remiss not to look at taxes. I don't think there's uh, a viable option, any one of the options that we've heard recently about, you know, perhaps there's a, a private sector vehicle uh, and or uh, other kinds of forms of revenue that might come out of development, for example, which is my world, are never, ever going to um, reach the magnitude of dollars that you need for the kind of infrastructure uh, we're now facing. There's just no chance that, 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 just to give you an example, an order of magnitude, I've heard, uh, at least from where I come from, the idea that perhaps you could have a development <coughs> levy, that you could have a development levy. Well, let's take the last few years where we built 40,000 um, new units a year on average in the city of Toronto. And let's say you levied a $5,000 uh, levy, just strictly dedicated to transit. Well, that amounts to $200 million. It's a drop in the bucket for what you um, And extrapolate that over a number of years, and you get a billion dollars. It's still not nearly enough. And let double that. You're at $2 billion. You're still not where you need to be. So any notion of uh, having a dedicated levy or tax that's paid by growth alone uh, is not going to work. Uh, the reason why I came on to the 1% solution was because I've, I've seen it work in California, and if you do it right, it can be a constant source of income to fund the kinds of transit infrastructure that we need, and certainly uh, in the kinds of amounts that are credible so that you can give back to the community that's paying this 1%. And again, if you do it right, there's some issues that you have to resolve. But those kinds of uh, taxes 
So I really believe that it's got to be tax-based, and we need the political will to uh, look at that realistically and implement it before it's too late. Because the numbers aren't, and I'm sure Gary can tell you this, the numbers aren't getting smaller. The more and more we wait to build this kind of infrastructure, uh, the number only gets larger and more daunting. Yeah, I'll, I'll talk a bit about, is this a city problem or is it a regional problem? And I'm, I'm a little bit biased. Uh, number one, Go Transit is a regional service provider, but also with Metrolinx, uh, we're also dealing with a, a regional transportation problem because uh, transportation uh, gridlock or, or congestion or whatever is doesn't stop at Steeles Avenue. It doesn't stop at the Humber River. It's really a problem that really in this, the greater Golden Horseshoe really is a, a, it's a problem all over the place. Um, and part of it is, like you said, the development that's happened, the sprawl that's happened. Uh, um, my wife refers to it as the granite countertop, where everyone really wants the granite countertop, and they're actually willing to live 20 miles further away because they want the granite countertop, and they can't afford to live in the city. Um, but, but sprawl has happened. We have to live with that sprawl for, um, for decades, if, if not for generations. And so therefore, any solution that we come up with really has to look at, at it from a regional perspective. Um, it can't just look at it as a unique project along Eglinton Avenue or along Shepherd or whatever. It's really a, a situation where we need transportation improvements, uh, whether it's roads, uh, whether because buses ride on roads, so therefore I'm all for improving roads as well as, uh, as building subways or light rail systems or commuter rail systems. We have to look at the whole gambit in order to solve the transportation problem. And therefore, any kind of a funding application has to be on a regional basis. One of the problems, it's only one, is that the conversation about transit has been dominated by rich people. People who have cars, whose kids have cars, whose neighbors and brothers have cars. And so if they dominate the conversation, then what they want is cheaper cars. And we made car driving cheap. Relatively low taxes on, on gasoline, prices on gas have been have been low historically. Um, the, the car taxes virtually cover nothing of the expenditures connected to the car. And then in Toronto, we just killed 60 bucks per car on, on a recent tax for no reason that anyone can understand. So we have to turn around the priorities and start thinking about ordinary people. Because ordinary people take the bus or the subway if there is one. And they don't drive in cars, especially as you see in Ontario, in, the, in southern Ontario, one person per car. Doesn't happen. So we've got to start rethinking that. Um, and if we're going to think about transit from that point of view, you mustn't think about it in terms of city boundaries. The only question you ask is, where does the guy in the bus want to go? That's the only question. How do we get the guy in the subway home from work? And where is that going to be? If you don't have that as your parameter, you really aren't thinking in terms of what people really need. That actually is a great segue into the next question, which is what ways do you see solving gridlock as a means to address the city's social deficit and opportunity gap? Gary, do you want to read that? Yeah, I... I first of all, I don't think we'll actually ever solve gridlock. I, I, I think it's, a, it's something that we should aspire to try to do, but I don't... When I look at all the great cities of the world, gridlock is actually a way of life in, in all the large cities. Cities that actually don't have gridlock actually mean that you don't have jobs and employment and you've got a really a lot of problems. So I think gridlock is a fact of life. But I think what you're, what you're really trying to do with what I call the transit solution is actually providing people with an alternative. So some people have a choice they can drive, some people want to take the bus, some people want to take subways. But what you're trying to do is really say to people we have an alternative. The difficulty we have in, in uh, this city region that we live in is really the fact that you've got um, different pockets of employment, income levels, and the need for people to go from point A to point B. B. And, and earlier debates that we had in the big move was the whole discussion about um, uh, people who live up in the Jane Finch area. How do they get down to, for example, Scarborough, where the job is? Their their cultural base, or and even their their home base, really, is up in in the northern part of the city, but they're trying to get down to Scarborough. It takes an hour and a half, two hours to go by transit. If you drove it, it probably wouldn't take that long. But the thing is, they don't have the income for a car. 
uh, likewise, some, some people don't want to contribute to the pollution in the air or anything else like that. So I think it's, it's viewed as really as an alternative choice for people so that they can actually, what we would hope to be, would be to take the right choice, which is to use transit for those ship trips which really they, are, they could make available to do. And so that ties into the planning as well? Yes. I, I like to um, refer to other examples, like everybody does when you have a transit discussion. But I think that the you know, facility of use, if we're going to have real options, um, and I think um, Mr. Rubin's point is well taken, there are a number of a good parts of the population where that choice doesn't exist. Uh, for economic reasons, they have to take the transit. And they should be a big part of the discussion because they have to get to work and they have to get home. No question. Um, but if we're going to solve the gridlock problem, we have to get people out of their cars. And to get people out of their cars, because we are creatures of habit, it's human nature to take the, uh, the easiest way, the most comfortable way. And if we don't improve our system, the reach of the system, um, and I think you got to talk about Toronto in the context, certainly our regional solution is absolutely a must. But we also have to talk about the kind of system we're going to build. We have to build a grid. I mean, to have a linear system just doesn't work. It doesn't serve the population. The Young Street line is, quite frankly, uh, at such a capacity right now, it's hugely uncomfortable to even ride it during. And I'm, and I'm not, not talking about just normal discomfort of being in a crowd. Of, you can't get on it. I rode it on Friday at about 5.30 from the King Street up to Bloor, and so many people were just left at the platform because we were just jammed in like sardines, and it was extremely difficult. So you, you've got to make um, a reasonable alternative available, and that means the fabric of the system, its grid, the facility of its use, and um, <coughs> I'm going to show you something. Just indulge me for a minute, because I think it's symbolic of what a system could be. And I'm a little bit more hopeful than Gary. I think we can give you the visa card. The visa card. <laughs> okay, so this is this is this is a this is a London Transit Oyster card, and you go, okay, great. It's a London Transit Oyster card. You wave it in front of the turnstile. It lets you. You can charge it on the machine. You can do it online. You plug in your number. It recharges to a balance that you suggest through your computer. It's part of the technology that we have today. All of us use ATMs. It's really simple, but this is symbolic of something that London has done extremely well. You can get on a bus in London, and you can reach a tube station within about anywhere in the city. The whole city, all of Greater London, and you can get to a tube station anywhere between 10 to 15 minutes tops. And you arrive there, and you're on the tube system, and it really does work. So instead of checking whether or not you know you paid your fare, your staff is there facilitating the, the transit rider, with directions, helping them with other issues because they've taken care of this problem already. And it's just easy to use. I can't tell you how easy the London system is to use, and I think that's one of its great successes. So I think we have to create an alternative for the, the drivers that are out there, that are in their cars, and create a system. And it's not going to happen, right? It's going to take another, it's going to take decades to do it, but we need to start creating that system. Jerry's got a card. Can you go first? <laughs> I was just going to show the, the Presto card, which of course we're, we're moving towards that way through Metroids. Uh, we hope TDC will come on board. We've got 14 plus subway stations now outfitted for Presto. So we are creating, from a fair perspective, that seamless sense of the system. Um, and it is starting to happen. I just want to take up on something that you said. Um, I don't want us to, to, to set the bar too low. We should be dreaming higher than gridlock is always going to be with us. Uh, but we always have to have a car problem. We don't. The answer is... <laughs> the answer is really quite easy in terms of ordinary capitalist economics. You tax the hell out of a car and driving the car. You make it expensive beyond belief so that people don't buy cars. And you take that money and you put it into a transit system that actually will work and make people happy. And I'll take the car and you'll take the car if it's easy and relatively cheap. But it's just old economics. Make it happen. We can do better than saying, well, ours is going to have good luck, but we'll make it better. We'll fix it a little bit. That's the point I want to make.
When I was saying gridlock, I was talking about... You've got to take the down, you have no power. Okay. Yeah, when I was... Yeah, now I've got the power. When I was saying gridlock, I wasn't, I wasn't actually talking about road gridlock. I was actually talking about transportation gridlock, because TDC subway is congested, the GO transit system is congested. And actually, if you go to London Underground, if you want to talk congestion about the underground system, I've never seen so many people crammed into a subway vehicle as I have in London. And they've got transit all over the place. So, and in London, they've even got pedestrian gridlock. I think as cities, cities are large population centers and, and people are moving around all over the place and that's the kind of gridlock I think that's going to happen. What I was talking about was saying, it's recognizing the fact that because we are all in one place and we all are trying to move all over the place, we have to give as many alternatives as possible for people. So that some people who have to take a car can take a car, but other people who actually have a choice of taking transit or even walking have the ability to take those or riding bicycles. You have to explore all of those opportunities, I think. Great, thank you. Um, we'll go on to the next question. Do you think politicians and the community should play a role in deciding what kind of transit we need and where it should go? So, Peyton, um, do you want to leave us? Hey, somebody's got to do this. Somebody has to do this. And under our system, politicians get to make these choices. I'm not sure there's a better system. Though there are times when you look at those choices and say anybody can do better than this. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't really see an alternative. Uh, that's just a simple fact. And I agree. I mean, we are a democratic society. I think uh, politicians, the community, um, the technical people, uh, there's a large group that have to actually be involved in the decision making process. Um, as operating agencies, TTC, Go Transit, uh, all these other ones, we, we actually make recommendations that actually the, the politicians can then make decisions from. They can either accept the recommendations or not accept and make their choices. They do represent the, the public. Uh, and I think it's just a fact of life. That's how we've grown as a North American society, and we'll never get away from that. Okay. Uh, certainly, I mean, we're, we, that's our system we've got, and we need to work with it. Um, but I, I particularly like Clayton's previous point about engagement. Uh, I think it's important to get those communities that wouldn't otherwise be heard um, in all of the transit noise, and those are the people that actually need the system the most. Um, they need to come to the forefront, and I think it's incumbent upon the political system to allow them to come to the fore and have their voices heard. So I think that engagement is critical. Um, I'm I'm sorry that this. I mean, I wish this forum was, that we have right here was much much larger. We have talked about that. Getting more people involved in the discussion. And I think that uh, we have to get our political leadership to uh, make the hard choices and, uh, and uh, do the, the most good for the greatest number of people in regards to transit. Great. Okay, the GTA not only has gridlock on our roads, but we have jurisdictional gridlock, with each municipality fighting for fares in order to pay their operating costs. For example, a bus will drive past transit use because it only serves Mississauga and can't pick up those riders at the Toronto stops. Do you believe we should amalgamate the transit authorities into a single regional authority? How can we unravel the jurisdictional gridlock? Um, uh, sure, I, I don't mind leading on that one. It's an easy answer. Um, absolutely. I mean, uh, as much as I can get nostalgic about the TTC, um, it, it needs to morph into or go transit, whatever. It doesn't matter which way you look at it, whether you're expanding or shrinking, or whatever you're doing. But certainly a regional system that doesn't respect political boundaries is an absolute cost. Now, if we're really going to solve this problem, you're going to have to uh, uh, get one system, <coughs> one authority, and they're going to have to be empowered and funded properly so that we have a regional solution. Because quite frankly, from Hamilton to Clarington, all the way up to uh, past the Oak Ridges Moraine, we're talking about a seamless fabric of the city, and uh, the city takes different shapes and forms and has different requirements, but an integrated system has to be planned at that regional level and implemented at the regional level. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it, I think the important thing is to realize is that most of the transit systems actually right now cooperate unbelievably well together. Um, especially at the middle management level where we solve problems on a daily basis to, to try to 
make people's trips as easy as possible. 90% uh, of most transit trips are actually local in nature. Very few actual trips cross regional boundaries. And those that actually do go transit carries the majority. Um, so I think the amalgamation of, of transit systems, although I think it's, again, it's one of these aspirational things that we can all move towards, it's not as important as funding. Funding, I mean, you can amalgamate all the transit systems together and all well and good, but if you haven't got the funding in place, you've just got one large transit system now that you've got to provide funding for as opposed to um, smaller ones and, and other needs. So um, I, I wouldn't want to divide the debate. We've got a big debate ahead of us on the funding issue. And if you throw another big one on, which is amalgamating all the transit systems, you're probably going to split the debate about people defending their home turf and really the debate should be right now on how do we get funding for all the transportation improvements that are required to support the growth of this region. Great, thank you. Hey. Nothing to add. Nothing to add, but okay. The next uh, question, we also have political gridlock. Politicians and political parties don't want to come out in favor of any tax increases, even a dedicated transit tax, and the result is that transit funding has become a political football. What can transit advocates do to convince politicians that they will lose more politically by not addressing gridlock than they would by supporting a dedicated tax. Clayton, do you want to answer that one? I don't think there's anything beyond the obvious. Uh, we've, got to, we've got to stop letting <coughs> politicians uh, divide things up so that they say, oh, my jurisdiction, my ward, my people need X, and not worrying about anybody else. That's one of the things. Because if you allow them to do that, all the energy you could bring to bear doesn't produce a result that's good for the whole. Um, and beyond that, you organize. You, you start a discussion that's different from the usual one politicians have about how, well, here's the pie and we can't do anything but enlarge it and then nothing can be done. That conversation has to be changed. Um, the, uh, I start off all my things with them because these are I mean, the questions that you could spend hours discussing, but it's, uh, it's really interesting because the way we debate transit is, uh, are you in favor of like more taxes to pay for transit? Really what we should be saying is, are you in favor of more gridlock? That's really what the debate should be about. It's very interesting. I was at, a, I was at a, an event the other day where they were actually uh, discussing a fundraising event that ha actually happened down in the States where they were uh, introducing a 0.7% sales tax on the local tax base of a very relatively small community in order to keep the libraries open. And they realized that they were actually going to lose the campaign because the, a lot of local residents were, not, I'm not in favor of paying more taxes. They reversed their campaign and they said, are you, are you in favor of closing the library? It had nothing to do with the tax increase. It was really the consequence of you not supporting this. And I think that's, the big debate has really been on here is, is do you want to pay more taxes? Well, no one wants to pay more taxes. No one wants to pay for it. Everyone thinks that all the stuff will materialize out of the air and be built. So no one really wants it. But really what you're doing is saying to people, do you actually want more congestion in your life? Do you want to spend, you know, another, as, as we investigate ourselves, do you want to spend another 30 minutes in gridlock? Because that's what it's going to be like in 10 more years and 20 more years. Too. So I, I think that we have to rephrase the debate. That will bring the politicians on side. The public is ahead of the politicians. The public actually wants improved transportation services. I think the politicians are holding back for fear of possibly losing some votes. Well, this is where I need to put a plug in for the Civic Action Group because they're, they've got their 32 minutes. Do you want an additional? What would you do with that extra 32 minutes? That, uh, other than that, um, I'll have to uh, uh, agree to disagree with Gary on the issue of political gridlock because I think that the regional seamless system at the political level. I understand at the implementation level that there's a lot of synergies and people work together, but at the political level, you can't have Hazel McCallion saying one thing and Doug Ford saying another, and perhaps somebody else in Markham saying something completely different, and expect to get the higher levels of government to buy in. You need that, because everybody has to make the political decision. That's Aristotle, what's in it for me. And so, the me, the definition of me, has to change. I think Clayton's right. You have to look at a greater good, a greater number of people. And you start the debate with that question, as opposed to, you said it yourself, one specific line over another. 
but on a regional transit system that's going to benefit everyone economically, environmentally. Then you change the debate. Then it becomes a lot more powerful. If you had an organized regional effort and you went to the premier of the province and to the prime minister and you said, this is important, and it's important to the entire region, and we're all on the same side, it's pretty powerful. A lot more powerful than having a bunch of bickering mayors and, and councillors. Uh, I just, I'm not sorry, I just can't take this piecemeal approach. I just don't think it will work. When you look at New York, New York's building two subway systems as we speak, the Long Island Railroad in from Long Island to Grand Central, uh, nine and a half billion Second Avenue subway line to an already well-developed system, a mature system. 17 billion is the second largest project in the world, the largest in North America. And where's the money coming from? It's coming from the state, it's coming from the Fed. And it's because they have a very strong unified voice in the NPA. And they've got the support of the governor, the state, and the city. And it's about, it doesn't matter how they got there, but it was a powerful political lobby. And that's how they get it. London has, correct me if I'm wrong, Gary, um, capital commitment of, from the feds. It's guaranteed just for, it's a mature system. This is just for, for capital expenditure. It's a billion and a half pounds per year for the next 10 years. That's a significant sum of cash. And that's not for a new line, really. It's for capital expenditures, just to improve the system they have. So I think you need that, and it's coming from the federal government. So for us to succeed, Change the debate, yes, but do it in a coordinated, uniform, and regional fashion. Otherwise, the message isn't quite as strong as it should or needs to be. I, that goes into the next question that I have because the debate has been for the last few years around LRT versus subway, at least in Toronto. Um, so, what are your thoughts on subway versus LRT debate? In your opinion, do you think it's better to invest in subways and pre zone density along those subway corridors? <coughs> Or do we build transit lines based on current development and ridership trends? Um, yeah, well, number one, we don't actually build uh, um, subway lines based upon current developments or, or LRT lines. Actually, when we look at transportation planning, we do look at the future, we do look at uh, potential for rezoning and, uh, and things that go along with it. Um, I've been in, because I've worked in very many different places where subways work, LRTs work. There's no magic in one technology. It's really based upon what's the what are what are the, the forecasted ridership numbers. So, I mean, you can put all your money into into one line, or you can put your money into two different lines, and uh, and spread the benefits around. So it, it's a it's a question of how much money is available, um, the type of, uh, of construction that you have to go through. So, for example, on Eglinton, a big chunk of it is actually underground because of the densities around it, and we can't build it that great in the corridor. Uh, so it, it's really not a either or, it's we need everything. I mean, we need as much as we can get. And, and uh, moving on, what, what Alfredo said is that places like London and New York, they realize that by investing in infrastructure, they're actually investing in the economic health of the city. And they know that they'll get their money back tenfold from development, from economic activity, from social improvement, and everything else. Uh, we haven't... We haven't our federal government hasn't sorted that out yet here. We need to tap into uh, the psychology that's already out there in terms of our business. We know that we can get more dollars uh, when uh, we're building a community in, a, in an area that's well serviced by transit. There's no magic in that, it's obvious. And I can tell you that numbers, if you want to know, they're quantifiable. If you're building on a subway line, it's X. If you're building on a decently uh, developed streetcar line and it's going to connect with the subway system is why. And those are tangible, real values. So extrapolate that further into the economy. And I agree with Gary, it doesn't matter the, the methodology. The methodologies, though, have to work well together. In other words, one of the, one of the great things about the London system, again, a mature system, it's going to take a long time to get there, but you, you get from one mode of transportation to the other relatively simple. Mm -hmm. They've got beautiful hubs all the old stations that connect to the regional and national and local lines, and the bus systems get you there. So uh, a streetcar line, a dedicated streetcar line in Finch, sure, makes a lot of sense because you can move four or 5,000 people an hour, I guess, and um, gets you to uh, 
uh, one of the subway lines, either uh, in the future now to the line going to Durham University and up to Vaughan and or the Young Line. So um, as long as that transition is smooth and those are totally integrated, so where those lines meet, that's the critical issue. Because getting on a dedicated streetcar line is fantastic. I mean, it's not, we're not talking about the queen car and the king car anymore. We're talking about dedicated streetcar lines that move very quickly. Um, and uh, they're only fractionally slower. I think, as long as enough experts in the room, they're not that much slower than subway lines um, if they're done right. So um, I don't have a preference one way or the other, um, although um, the downtown relief line, which I like everybody to rename the city, because I don't like the idea of calling something relief, but um, you know, a city loop line would, with our with our streetcar, planned streetcar build, creates a grid, and it's an important grid where people then can understand that they can get into a more rapid transit system and connect to it much more easily than having to ride a bus for 40 minutes. Um, so that's important. And I mean, Boston is a great example of an integrated system. I mean, the Green Line and the Blue Line both have surface and below rail. The Green Line streetcar goes in uh, underground um, and connects with the Red Line. Um, so Boston's a great example of how an integrated system with both streetcar and subway can work. Great. I'm one, of, I'm one of those people who wants to pay more taxes because I think I want people treated better than they are, uh, particularly poor people, and I want my city to work better than it does because I live here and I care about it. So all I'm waiting for is an argument to be made as to why we need these things, why they will work better for us morally and politically and in terms of practical moving people. So if we make that argument, I don't care if we're making it for a subway or for a bus, um, as long as the damn thing works better and the argument gets made, because it's the argument that's going to work. People will spend more, more money, they will pay more taxes, if not happily, decently. And if we're Canadians and we, we accept this kind of approach to life, if the argument can really be made that this is better. Um, moving on to the next question. Should we build transit? Now this is where politics comes in again. Should we build transit to serve high priority neighborhoods or build transit to serve our high density neighborhoods where gridlock is at its highest? And is gridlock at its highest in these high density neighborhoods? Um, I have a faint idea. Okay. So when, when you're saying transit, you mean rapid transit? Um, any like, kind of transit. Transit is bus. So it's like you know, most of our, especially in the city and even in 905. We have a, actually a very well served bus network out there, so there is transit really in a lot of those areas. But I mean, really, the debate there on whether it should be high priority neighborhoods or high density neighborhoods is really the, the issue is we need both. It, it's not an either or, it's really it's got to be we've got to provide improved transit services for all of those kind of, uh, neighborhoods. And, uh, and the question is, is when you, uh, as the money comes in, priorities, priority projects come out based upon an economic analysis, a social analysis, and factor them all in and try to come up with the best solution. The Big Move actually does a lot of that. The Big Move actually builds on a lot of projects that have been studied to death over the last 20, 30 years and put them all into a nice compilation document. Um, so I, I, I think really it's just a question that we, we've got to try to provide them to all those communities. But like I said before earlier, the debate doesn't stop at 416. Gridlock is in 905, even worse than it is in 416. Is anyone driving down Highway 7 in, uh, in Markham or whatever it is? It, that's gridlock. So, I mean, it, it's a situation where there you've got low density neighborhoods still generating a massive amount of trips. And because the transit service isn't necessary there, they're all opposite. So, so the debate really goes beyond the boundary. Do you want to add anything? Um, I, I think the high priority neighborhood curve is a bit of a misnomer because I think all neighborhoods are high priority but for very different reasons. So if it's because of some sort of economic strife or a neighborhood strike, uh, those people deserve uh, an opportunity to travel from public transit like anybody else. And so I support, for example, 
was a lot of debate about the pinch line, the, 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 you know, the rail, does it really need it? Well, I think it is, because the Finch corridor is challenged for a number of reasons. You know, a lot of vacant properties, um, a lot of dereliction, um, neighborhoods in transition, and this line alone, and through, again, to get back to transportation planning, which is a big, I mean, I've got a big problem with the way the city undergoes its planning, but really needs to ramp up the connection between a new transit line and what happens in development and what can occur with development along those transit lines is absolutely critical that they work hand in hand and that not enough of that is going on. So concurrent with the new line has to be um, zoning approvals that take advantage of that line and sound planning so that those neighborhoods that are challenged are um, regenerated and, and become better neighborhoods. And, and there's no I mean, I don't, I'm certainly not in favor of identifying neighborhoods because we all have to pass through. And even though 90% of the commutes are local, um, we all, it's all part of our urban fabric. And part of Toronto's problem right now is we have an, we've got an us, them mentality. We've got, you know, 905 versus 416. We've got high priority neighborhoods against the downtown core. Uh, we even vote that way. And so our leadership has to now um, it's incumbent upon them to reach out to all of the neighborhoods in the city and to unify the city. And that means if you're going to spend public dollars, that's the way you do it. That's the glue. So if you're going to keep the, our society and the fabric of what it means to be Canadian, I think Clayton touched upon it, because we are a fair-minded people, one of the most fair-minded peoples in the world. And so, hey, pony up, pay the extra tax, but not just for this high-priority neighborhood or that priority neighborhood, but for all of the neighborhoods. I mean, it sounds like milk toast, but it's a fact. We have to, in fact, we have to really elevate. This is not going to work unless you elevate the entire society in the city. It just doesn't work. And it's just like, I mean, the idea of, of taxing people who use vehicles. We're going to get to that because Gary's right. Go to 905. It's worse between Steeles Avenue and Major McKenzie than it is in the whole parts of the downtown. Because everybody's driving an SUV and there's one person in every car. And it's, it's brutal. And these are not dense neighborhoods. These are low density neighborhoods. And it's, it's horrible. So that has to change. But you have to provide an alternative for them to get them out of their cars. And you need to tax gas guzzling cars. You need to. You have to have a higher tax. And right now it's, all, it's already working. Most people under 25 today um, have real choices about. They have choices to make because a lot of them can't afford the insurance. They're penalized already. They have to pay thousands of dollars to get a car insured. So they're usually a second or a third driver on another car that their parents may have. Um, and so they're looking to transit. And that and, and, and that's that's happening. So they're already being penalized. And we need to look at that model a little more carefully and see how we can uh, create that revenue out of those higher taxes and put it back into the system. So driving should be, in the future, a privilege. And if it's going to be a privilege, then you should pay for it. And that sounds a bit radical, but it's a fact. Because I'm, I'm not so sure if it's, if it's so privileged anymore. If you're sitting on Highway 7 <laughs> for 30 minutes and you've only gone 500 meters, yeah. what's, yeah. what's the great privilege in that? If you don't do it, you can drive away like this, theoretically. It's not going anywhere. I think now we'll um, open the, the um, Actually, questions. That's developing different frameworks where different funding mechanisms have been very successful throughout the world. Uh, I think the 1% solution really is representing the fact that we need to talk about funding for transit, whether it's the 1% solution, whether it's a, um, you know, like in Vancouver, they elevated the gasoline tax locally in the greater Vancouver area. They added um, a, a fee on to the electrical, your electrical charges. Uh, so there's a combination of, of funding mechanisms that need to be explored. I think as a, that's probably one of the big debates that has to come up is really, what is the dedicated funding? A lot of people said we can't put it on the property tax. Um, a lot of people have said, well, we can't put it on income tax. You know, everyone has got an opinion on it. And I don't think there's actually one solution. There's probably multiple solutions to this. And that's probably part of the, the big debate coming up that, uh, that as a society we're going to have to make.
Well, let me try and answer. I think so. <laughs> As the chair of the Toronto Transit Alliance, um, the reason we went with the 1% is because we wanted a, a regional solution. So if you go with property taxes, say tolls in Toronto or any of that, that's a Toronto fix, but it's not a regional fix. So a property tax in Toronto will raise so much money, but a property tax in Aurora will not raise as much. Whereas if we do a 1% sales tax, it could be applied across the board from, um, from Toronto all the way up to Hamilton. And that would raise money for the areas that need it most. So that's why we, we're really pushing that 1% solution. It's also true that sales tax is just the easiest way to gather money. It's the cheapest, most effective, most efficient. It's progressive, but it's the best in other ways. Where a room full of local retailers or, thing, or even citizens and um, trying to convince us of the benefits of uh, the sales tax versus the unintended consequences, uh, economic consequences to the local economy and to us uh, of that versus a congestion charge or, or smart tolling or something like that. Okay, I guess I'll try it. <laughs> One of the, the issues that we were facing is how um, how much did, did people notice that um, the HST came down from 14 to 13 percent? And it's surprising how few people really noticed it. Um, so when you're on the street, you're asking people. You ask them how much is how much do you pay in HST? A lot of people don't even realize what they're paying at this this stage. So that's surprising when you, when you see that. Um, but also, it's a tax that applies to everyone. So it's not just hitting the car drivers. It's not just hitting people who live in Toronto. It's applied to everyone. And people find that a more reasonable solution. And the fact that it can be applied across the board, not just in Toronto, makes it for the, the TTA, we believe it's one of the best solutions. Have I answered your question? Did you want to answer um, on? I, I like it because, and in some ways, it is a regressive tax because you know, everybody has to pay it regardless of status and income. But it is fair in the sense that people either, except for people who walk, I would imagine, but most people either drive or take transit to buy something. Actually, and I would argue that most purchases that are of a larger nature are done with a vehicle. So the tax then becomes a tax <laughs> to unlock the grid and in fact make our commute easier for everyone, cyclists, people who walk, cars, trucks, subway and bus riders. So the big issue for me is implementation and it's easy, certainly. The question becomes how do you, how do you manage the impact? How do you stop somebody from going to an area just outside the region to buy their fridge? So they're going to say 1%. So you have to look at the logistics. Maybe certain large items would have to be exempt. But I agree. I think that this impact would be minimal on the economy. And in terms of direct impact, in terms of will it, will it impact purchasing power and purchasing behavior? I don't think so. But the benefits are massive. The benefits to our economic health will be huge if we can get this steady stream of income into the coffers year in, year out. And it's a tool, quite frankly, that I think the municipalities now have at their disposal. And they're not, not allowed to. No, no, the so, sales tax. Not the sales tax, okay. So it would have to be, it would require a legislative change, but I would imagine that um, the governments would be more amenable to it um, if it was a directed tax and they could blame another politician for it. So uh, I'm in favor because I think it's the, one of the easiest and fairest systems and has the broadest benefit and doesn't uh, pinpoint any one sector. Okay. Uh, with respect to fairness, I wonder if Mr. Ruby can speak a little bit about what you said earlier about uh, sales tax being potentially regressive, if I heard you correctly. People without disposable income tend to spend all of their income, and so a sales tax would affect almost every dollar earned. So with respect to that, I wonder if you could compare 1% sales tax as a 
single or simple policy as opposed to a sales tax plus something like development charges and maybe making the equation a bit more complex. I wonder if you would be in favor or the other panel members would be in favor of the broadening it a bit. I think your, your question implies the correct solution. There is no magic in a single choice. Uh, we presented the 1% sales tax because, though regressive, it's really cheap and simple to get. It's the best government technique. It costs less to collect. More goes in the public coffers at the end. You don't spend money along the way, um, and nobody escapes. The regressive part is that it may take one one hundredth of a poor person's income away from them, whereas for a rich person, it would take one hundred thousandth of their income away from them. So the base, it's not graduated the way I prefer taxes to be. So that the poor, in fact, pay less and the rich pay much more. But having said all that, there is no one, one answer. Uh, if, if we use the 1% solution to focus attention on the need for a tax base to achieve this stuff, uh, that's all you really need. And what I do say is, I think this is the time when we actually can do it. Though the numbers are horrendously huge for an ordinary person to contemplate that need to be raised, we've never been at a time when people are getting more conscious of the need to raise that money and change the way we think and act. So I think this is a good time, despite the regressive nature of that tax. Uh, I'd also like to add that there are measures where you can mitigate that tax as a regressive tax. So, I mean, having some sort of tax credit go back to the lower revenue earners in society would be appropriate. So if everybody's paying the one percent, it doesn't mean that the taxing authorities can't go back and give some of that back to those who need it most. But then, I think, and I think that would be appropriate. But then it gets more expensive to collect. So you balance these things. Yeah. I, I think too, just on the fairness issue. And, and by the way, in the development industry would you know they love they love to hang me on this stuff. I'm not the most popular guy at UDI. But um, we don't call it that anymore, we call it something else. <laughs> Bill, that's right. So uh, they hang me for this, but um, I think it would be appropriate for developers to pay a special transportation money. Because guess what? We're getting more money for well serviced projects, transit. And I think it would be appropriate for us to pay. Yeah, I think my own. Uh, a lot of people who I talk to really, the, the big issue is not so much whether it's a 1% or whether it's uh, whether we're development fees or, or anything else like that. Really, the critical element is that it's dedicated to transportation. Uh, that's what the public, public, they don't mind paying if they actually know where that money is really going to. I'll use the $5 uh, tire tax that everyone pays. It was supposed to actually deal with environmental friendly <laughs> ways of eliminating the, Tired from the automobile industry. That money just went into general treasury, and its uh, tires are building up all over the place. So it's, it's. I think the public is saying we want a solution, but we want you to be honest with where the money is going to be spent. Exactly, I'm hearing the same thing as well. And this is just one solution. I also want to add. There's so many. There's property taxes. There's so many other solutions. But we need a solution that will, child, it will pay for the regional plan. And then there's so many things that we have to do within the city. So I think there's a, a number of solutions, and they're all good. We have to get the public fo focused on, on solutions. And I, I'm worried that the politics is broken and the press is broken. Politics is broken because if we can't achieve it in three years, no use talking about it. And if we're talking about 10-year and 20-year solutions. I'm worried that the press is broken because if it's not going to make a headline tomorrow morning, we ain't going to write about it. Like, we're not going to write about something that might happen in 10 years. That's no kind of news. So we want to write about Granny who needs a $40,000 medicine or she's going to die in three weeks. And we want to write about Ernie Eves, whose kid was killed on Highway 69. So the only things in the budget that are growing are health and education because Johnny's got to have enough room in his classroom. So I guess. I'd like to put it on a higher plane. How do we fix politics and how do we get the press interested in 10-year issues and optimizing and maximizing? <laughs> I, I don't think that's impossible. Um, it seems to me that um, issues come along 
which really do command public attention, which will not have an answer in the near future. Um, but if you can explain to people, and I think a dedicated tax is one of those mechanisms that's easily understandable, when the benefit's going to happen. I mean, it's not going to happen in the next three years. You can't build anything in that time. Um, and everybody's got kids and worries about them. So I think that there are issues where the press can understand it and communicate it, and where you can impress politicians that, yes, you, know, you may be out of office when this gets done, but somebody's got to move. I think these are arguments which, if we make them, and are serious about making them, will be successful. Look, when I, I ran um, for the mayor's race, we put something out, we put tools out, and it got people talking about it. But if we can build a platform for those politicians to get on, I think that will get the press, that will get the politicians talking about it. So I, I really believe it starts right here at the grassroots level, and we build from there. I, I, I'm not so cynical. I actually, <laughs> I actually believe that um, you can layer the issues that are right before us right now. I mean, everybody likes to hear and read about what they experience. That's what the press is about. I experienced something today, and they find they connect when the press expresses that collective experience. And we all collectively suffer from gridlock. And I think that's what you have to focus on. You mentioned it earlier. It's focus about fixing the gridlock and saying this is going to fix a gridlock problem. And it is a legacy issue, and you do have to talk about the future generations. That's what politicians are supposed to do, and they can never lose sight of that. So I think as a society, we have to remind politicians that they're there for the long haul. They're there to make decisions that are impactful many, many years beyond the time when they made them. I mean, that's how you build hospitals. That's how you build highways. So why, is, why are subways and streetcars and buses any different? So I think it's incumbent upon um, both politicians and the press to think in terms of legacy. But I also believe, I mean, we're, um, our, uh, we're apocalyptic by nature, that meaning that we, everybody thinks about the future and about their children and their children's children and health and safety issues. I mean, I, and then you're right, but let's put it in the context of health and safety. Let's put it in the context of our experience of gridlock, how much time we're losing, how much it's costing us. People like to know, hey, this is costing me. And that's where you got to go. But it's costing you not just in terms of dollars and cents. It's costing you in terms of the health of your of your society and the health of your children. That's where you, that's the context you have to put it in. So we have to get out of the the I guess the, the strict transit discussion about what's better, subway or streetcars, and talk about the bigger issues. We've got time for two more questions. So um, Frederick over here, and then oh, right at the front row. Uh, thank you very much for answering two of my questions. I'm writing notes on my Go Transit uh, ticket. I took it to Hamilton yesterday, or last week. I had a great time. Um, I have a, I'm really happy to hear about the politics and short-term politics being addressed. The individual taxation question has been addressed, and I'm grateful. I have a question about the corporate responsibility side and the corporate connectivity side. Two parts. One is we have a transit or a train corridor infrastructure in Toronto. We've inherited through 150 years of Grand Trunk, CN, CP, et cetera, et cetera. And where can we come up with a better strategy of getting their cooperation to help us build better networks through corridors that already exist? Added to that, Hydro Ontario has corridors that already exist. And I know these ideas have been bandied around, but I'd like strategically in this context to, to have your opinions on where we can take those. And then the idea of the sprawl we've had and the way the corporation headquarters located either inside the city boundaries or just beyond. How do we tap into Siemens, Microsoft, all the big giants who are just in Mississauga? And, and how do we get them involved so that the 1% solution that is put onto the individual income earner is also has as a co-strategy corporate assistance or corporate responsibility, or use whatever language you prefer. So I'd love to hear your comments on that if we have time. Yeah, um, with respect to the rail corridors, uh, Metrolinx uh, has actually acquired about 65% of all the rail corridors that we go transit operates on right now. 
line. So we, we actually do own a big chunk of those rail corridors. So for, for many years, the railways came into downtown Toronto and everything went out through the harbour. And uh, those days have gone and uh, a lot of the freight has moved away. Uh, in those areas, though, the, even those rail corridors that we've acquired, in order for us to run a higher frequency of rail service, there's still a lot of investment because those rail corridors were really designed for primarily a single freight train operating to provide a what I call a normal transit type service. You need to have two tracks, three tracks, or sometimes even four tracks. So there's still a lot of money that needs to be put into it. The railways, those C and CP, they're private corporations. They're, uh, they're, they have to make a profit to survive, and uh, they're business people. And, and uh, we found that in dealing with CNCP, if you're willing to walk to them with a checkbook in your hand, it's amazing what they can do, because they look at it as a, as a business venture. But again, it comes back to, is there enough money? How do we get that money? <coughs> et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It, it comes back. So, but I, and, and likewise, though, I do think that um, the private corporations um, do view a certain level of social responsibility for, for transportation improvements. It's, it's to their benefit actually to have improved transportation because it brings better workers to their, uh, to their offices, to their businesses, manufacturing centers, whatever it is. So I think they're, again, it's one of these things where if they're, they're willing, if, if for example a 1% sales tax solution is on the agenda, corporations, they buy a lot of things. That 1% solution will apply to them, so there will be money flowing, flowing from them in that, in that context. We're going to one more question at the front here. Okay. Um, there are uh, many times where I've tried to contact politicians at various levels uh, with regards to um, building, funding, better transit, whatever it may be, and uh, I usually get either ignored or a form letter back. Uh, who would you say are some of the, the current strategic allies, politically speaking? Um, and, uh, you know, looking like we're coming up to the provincial election, uh, who should we be eyeing to make sure that these ideas come into their platforms that we'll be hearing about that will hopefully become the headlines? I like Sarah Thompson. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm biased, so I, have, I, I shouldn't yeah. say anything. So. I'd probably get killed if I answered the question. <laughs> 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 I asked you to But I've always yes. stepped into deep water before. But that, I mean, a lot of the <coughs> politicians, they're, they're elected and, and they move along their way. I think uh, that they take advice from people. Uh, they're not making their decisions independently on, on trans or anything else like that. There's a lot of decision makers that, that help them in that process, whether it be in the corporate world, the social world. Or whatever. So, uh, so it's not just the politician that you really want to tap into. You want to tap into the, um, I'll call it the, the 25 year old political advisor that's actually providing advice. You want to tap into the uh, uh, the education portfolio. The president of U of T talking about transit. The president of uh, the Royal Bank talking about transit improvements. Then they'll start to listen because they're hearing it not only from their voter base, but they're also hearing it from the corporate base that are, they're bringing a lot of revenues into uh, to the province. So, so don't put all of your all of your uh, vote into the politician. There's a lot of other people in, in this big decision-making process that have to be touched. Excellent answer. Very well spoken. Very critical answer. <laughs> <laughs> But it, it ties into the fact it's up to all, every one of us. If we come together and we start being heard and taking our, our voices to the politicians and building them up so they have the ground to stand on, I think that's where we really um, enact change. So I'd like to just round this up and, and give my thank yous to Clayton Ruby, Gary McNeil, and Alfredo Romano for, for a wonderful panel. Thank you. great space they've given us tonight. Nice. I'd like to thank the volunteers who make this all happen and are pouring the drinks back there. Um, and also I want to thank the sponsors, uh, PB World, Ellis Dawn, ACOM, MMM Group, Stolport, Delcan, PNR Railworks, and Tom's Place for being there and providing this uh, space for us. So thank you so much and please stay. Um, we're going to network, we're going to talk, and if you have any issues and you'd like to talk further, please stay um, and eat some of the food. There's still food left. Okay, thank you so much for coming.
Take it away. I was just gonna come take it. Go ahead. Take it. So take the picture. You sure? Yeah. Okay.